in Jesus afternoon. I just contacted Sandra a year, almost a year ago, and I'm so excited that the day has come when we can finally um, hear her presentation as she talks to us about <clears throat> on the topic of modifying and creating accessible material for children with the loss. Not going to take more of Sandra's precious time with us. So, again, welcome, Sandra, and, and I think we're here to treat today. I wanted to welcome all of you to Accessible Books and Literacy, Supporting and Encouraging a Love for Literacy. Um, Sandy Kenrick, I live in Rapid City, South Dakota, and that, uh, if you're familiar with the area, is where Mount Rushmore is located. I'm going to try to turn my slide here a little slow. Let's see. Well, we're just waiting to switch over. Hopefully it works for me. A little bit about myself. I have taught nine years in general education classrooms. Uh, I did about six years elementary education, so that's eight and nine-year-olds. I taught in third grade, and then I am currently teaching high schoolers American Sign Language. Um, I know why my screen is not turning here. Of course, before all of you came and it worked just fine. <laughs> Let's try here. Hmm. There it is. Oh, there we go. We can so, go. Perfect. We can. And sorry, I don't know what happened there. Well, this is my family. I just want to introduce uh, my two boys. The oldest one who's standing up next to me there, his name is Liam. He is seven years old. He attends a mainstream classroom. He's in second grade. And he is deaf blind. My youngest one who's on my lap there, he's four years old. His name is Finn. And he has typical vision and hearing. Basically. Talk about him a little bit. He was born with typical vision and hearing. He was born healthy, um, healthy boy. When he was two years old, he became sick with meningitis. He's two and a half years old. Uh, so when that happened, we were airlifted to a, a town about five hours away. Uh, spent a few months in the hospitals um, and hospitals uh, complications due to the meningitis. When all was said and done, we brought home a boy who was deaf and blind. He, how did I get started creating accessible books? Well, when we brought home Liam. I was about eight months pregnant with his little brother at the time. Brought Liam home, and one of the things he loved to do uh, before he got sick was to read books. What are your favorite things to do? So when we brought him home, now deaf blind, found his stack of books or his little box of books. And I uh, specifically read him throwing them across the room. The books loved had absolutely no meaning to him anymore, and they were very frustrating to him that he uh, couldn't see anything. And that's later, 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 he now he finds happens to find a book that doesn't have braille in it or tactile pictures, he called them empty books. So he's not impressed. <laughs> but it was that moment that it was breaking to me, actually, um, bringing him his books. I decided from that moment on, I'm going to make reading, except I was going to make it fun again. Somehow, I didn't know how. But I was going to make it where my little boy was going to be able to enjoy books again. So I started uh, with that picture I left of the little book with a star cookie cutter on it. I had to make a shape book. book. The thing I could think of, I knew if I had pictures, he'd have to be able to see them. I know he was not a brailer at the time, but I knew I wanted him to be, and he was going to be, so I wanted to make sure that he had at least access to brand. So my very first book um, I found at the 
a local store, a cardboard book with some little rings to bind it. And I found whatever shapes that a good feel to it, I glued it onto the book. So I had the star there. I had a heart that had these bumps all over it. I had a wooden, uh, I think it was a circle, a bunch of shapes that had different feel and that would be fun and motivating for him to read and enjoy. I, at the time, knew absolutely nothing about Braille, didn't have uh, any access to a, a Braille rate or anything like that. So I contacted his TVI, his teacher of the impaired, from his uh, birth to, I think, three program it was at the time. And I asked him, if I give you a list of words, would you be able to add, a, um, or put them in a Braille label for me so I could add them to these books I'm making for Liam? And he, of course, said absolutely. Absolutely. So that was my very first book I ever made right there was the shape book. Um, the second one is the one the right there. You'll see it's a counting book. I make it interactive, so I just glued some different um, real-life items onto the pages that he could count. And then, of course, on the other side of the, the little flap there, you can't see it, but there's Braille. All included is the sign language picture show number four. And we were all learning sign language at the time. Um, new language for our little guy. So that, of course, is how I got started creating accessible books. Those are my very first two ones I ever made for Liam. And just for fun, he absolutely loved the books I made for him. Um, he started to really, and to this day, reading and Braille are, are his absolute favorite thing to do again. So very about that. Share ideas and strategies. So when I started making my books, it was really hard for myself as a parent. I had no idea about it or where to start. And even looking online, uh, uh, grown up a lot since I started. But looking online, I couldn't find anything uh, to help me get started. And I wanted to change that. I wanted to offer my ideas that I had and share them with families, with teachers, educators, whoever is with a child with vision and parents and didn't know where to start. I wanted to be able to share my ideas and put them out there. So I talked to uh, state's uh, outreach coordinator, and she hooked me up with a new website at the time. It was a newer website called Best to Literacy website. And you'll see on the screen here the address for that website. And a great website uh, supported by Perkins School for the Blind and Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And that website actually there shows my a link to all of my every strategy or book or anything that I've posted is right on that link there. My name that I go by is Liam's mom. So that kind of should be a great resource for you where you can get ideas, different ideas, and also where you can share your ideas. I wanted out today, but I'm going to be talking a lot about ways that you can create accessible books and literacy materials and modify. But I wanted to start out with what I believe is extremely important and setting a great foundation for support. A lot of literacy is creating an accessible environment. This does include home environment, school, your church, community environment, anything that you can think of where a child with vision impairment is going to be. I want you thinking about is it to them? So that we, or I've made at home, uh, our home accessible, our home environment accessible, we label everything in the house with Braille. And of course, can be adapted if you're the child you're working with needs large print, isn't quite um, reading Braille yet, you can pair it with tactile symbols or objects. But anything in the house that has We I sure to put it in brails around the house. So a couple examples I just showed you here is our coat hooks. I will, you know, Liam gets his own hooks, Finn has his mom's hook. Uh, the switches say on and off. Our poster had Bray showing how is it the one, two, four that shows if you want it, you know, light toasted or really dark. The microwave numbers, if you if you see it are really flat, so we put Bryn there so he can help be a part of cooking, and that's accessible to him. Um, something that you can think of to label that's meaningful 
that's what uh, we have done at our house. And that's why that I think is important that all children need a rich environment in a format that is accessible to them. Here's what we've done, I've done at home. Um, the first time every year, I make Christmas labels to put on the presents. And like little gift pigs, his are accessible to him. I put his name in the mail. I put little Christmas stickers that are uh, tagged that he can feel. And I've started also doing this for other people in the family. So when it's time to pass out the gifts at birthdays or Christmas, he can read who they go to and be a part of helping passing those out. We buy a Candyland game. Uh, boards we try to make accessible so we can play all together as a family. So I added Brill and some tactile pieces to that. The picture lower left is an advent calendar. And those little circles, there's 25 of them, and they're numbered 1 through 25. So the first to the countdown all the way to Christmas, you add a little ornament. Very hands-on, very accessible and tactile. Nothing he can touch. Another is uh, just the environment, like your, this we add Braille to that, to house numbers, you can add Braille to anything that shows you know, that Braille has power has, and has meaning, and that's, that's accessible to him. One of my favorite things that I've had for Liam that is uh, includes Braille, uh, putting Braille everywhere he can get his hands on, is our new place that, that I, I was able to find this website that made some nice, sturdy outdoor Braille labels for me. And, and what he's touching there on the left is, is the word slide. The playground, you can see the fence surrounding the playground there. There's little wooden plaques that have Braille he can feel. Four of them have the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, on the correct um, place on the fence. So great for orientation mobility. We have that we recently got this summer that has these nice outdoor labels as well. To make the home accessible, and this can, of course, be adapted for other situations, too, at school or what um, at church. We've used them, too. But there are, are examples of our left one is actual real, um, objects that you can put on this little chore chart or it could be a schedule, whatever you want. So I put a little cute little sock there for when he helps fold laundry. Um, and then the flowers for any water is the plants. Of course, it would be great to add the Braille to, to pair that. To the, right, the picture to the right is a more um, updated version of a chore chart where magnets can be moved to done and finished. Everything is um, and just in Braille there. We have moved to um, trend from objects being done to now just Braille. So whatever's appropriate for your uh, you're working with, it can be easily modified. Experiment uh, is school, a big one, <laughs> that alone is necessarily a very accessible place, at least not in a mainstream classroom like my son has. It's first not the most accessible place for a child with vision impairments. Here are some examples uh, of what we've done. Of course, everything should be labeled in Braille, all doors. Um, labeled in the classroom and print should also be labeled in Braille at a spot where he can touch it. Um, this candor I made for him was one, I think it was last year, where it included Braille with the symbols. And when they did, the kids did classroom calendar together, he could have his calendar with and be following along with them. We put uh, dates on the calendar or so events that happen each day on the calendar. For example, on Mondays was library, so it's a piece of a cardboard like his books. For P on Tuesdays, a gym, a little piece of a rubber ball cut out and glued on there. Um, the little wood sticks you see is for music days because he gets to play on little xylem with the wooden mallet. So that represented uh, music for him as well. Now we, of course, have transitioned to, his, he's improving in his braille skills. We've transitioned to a camp a little smaller, still fairly big, but includes braille only. The left is really fun. This one is in kindergarten, I believe. He's in second grade now, but when he was five years old, his little friends in his class 
classrooms would get him the sweetest little notes and draw pictures for him. And learning to write so they'd have some simple sentences there. It was sweet and kind of his friends to write that. that some, there was no meaning to them. It was just the blank pieces of paper again. So I created for this bucket of notes for Liam to bring to school that included a lot of um, fun stickers that were fun to touch. So they create pictures with them. They, I, uh, I put these lab braille labels in there, so different words, so the kids could use the words and create sentences out of them. So they're working, the students were working their writing skills as well as, and reading, as well as Liam was going to be able to do that. It was included and accessible and inclusive and accessible. So that's another way to make his environment something that works for, for everybody. Right, this first grade last year's desk schedule. So as his peers may have a, a schedule on, say, the whiteboard of what they're doing uh, as a for the day, Liam's is on his desk. This one has the Braille paired with objects and try to use real life when possible. For example, lunch, he has a fork, a piece of a fork broken off, recess, the rocks to present recess because there's books outside that they walk on. So that was just an example of he gets to set it up each morning, how his schedule can be accessible for him. Tied community, church stores, restaurants, all together. Church, we make sure he has a schedule that's very similar to what they have at Slight. I just mimicked it and made one for church. He has labels. He, um, his materials are Braille. Uh, when the restaurant... Uh, not really to the stores. I try to make sure that he has a Braille list. It makes fun and motivating for him, but he gets to see again that Braille has meaning and power. And this school supply list I made for him it used actual real pictures paired with the Braille, so he knew what we were looking for. So here we the store buying his school supplies. So he got to find each item on the list. Now we've transitioned this year or last year to a Braille only list. This year we're transitioning to where he's actually writing the Braille list himself and bringing it with to the store. A lot of different options you can do. Start with the fun part, modifying books and uh, creating accessible literature. The reason, uh, the need for accessibility, uh, one of my big pushes, especially in school, was when he started kindergarten, he would get things like this home. A, a book with no bread. There would be worksheets and there would be classroom readers that needed to uh, be modified for him. Of course, he has a great team where a lot of his materials um, are and created for him there, but then there were still some things that were coming home uh, that weren't. And so, as the team, we saw the need. And now I'm really pleased to say. Um, to like three years later, was down to a well-oiled machine, and everybody does their part on the team. And Liam uh, are modified for him, whether it's the brand, the page, or having to use real like objects to go with it, anything like that. But this child has um, an accessible uh, materials in classroom at school. So uh, different, um, the di different. Books that were, yeah, books that I'm being looking at today. I'll talk about experience books, creating uh, experience books, conversation boxes, story boxes or story bags, tile books, and adapt classroom readers and adapting science books and fiction readers. So I'm going to be starting with experience books. This one's one of my favorites. There are a lot of goals that can be met when creating experience books. First of all, it's, of course, going to be accessible and motivating for the child. That's one of my favorite things about it. An experience book simply a book that is created about the child's experience from their experience. It can be created by you or child or both, but it's about their experience. They're the expert. It makes it very motivating for them. And some of the learning goals that you can have for creating one of these books is there's 
a greatness if you have speech goals and that my son at that time right there, I believe he was probably three and a half, maybe four. One of our goals was uh, to just, we're trying to get him to sign and engage in conversations back and forth. And so that would be a great speech goal where you could use this. One of my goals, of course, is reading, uh, getting to uh, the skills. And so experience books are great for this. This book that you hear is he went to gymnastics. And so we, would, we wrote a book about his uh, gymnastics experience. And I had on the front the blue foam there to represent the mat. He had a ball pit that he could jump in that was like these foam cubes that he jumped into this pit of foam cubes. So we had, I had a foam piece of the foam cube that I glued onto the book. So when he read that part, he had, he could actually feel the foam that he had jumped into. There's a pole that he swung from. So I had a pole in the book when it talks about him swinging. There was a beam that he walked across that was wooden, like this wooden plank. I put a small piece of wooden plank actually in the book. And there's the crow too, so they could come off. But it's a great thing uh, to encourage conversation. It can be great for any goals you have if you're working on specific vocabulary. But the biggest thing I can say is if you're having issues with having a kid that's just not motivated to read, I would strongly suggest an experience book. Very motivating because it's something about their what they're interested in for one, one expert in it, which helps them to be successful in reading it. Create an experience book. Use actual mementos from the experience. Plan ahead. When I know I want to make a book, for example, if we're going to the farm, I had what kind of things do I want to collect? I have a special I'll sling across sadly bag purse kind of thing that I always take and it's we only use it when we're gonna create a book. So he knows when I bring this bag out, we're gonna be making a book after the experience. So that's just one idea. And so he knows if we're at a farm and we feed the cow some hay, we're gonna put some hay in our bag. If we have um if we ate some candy that we got there, we're gonna put the wrapper in there. If we Anything that we use, we're going to put it in this bag. So he knows that that's going to be used. That's part of routine. That's part of the book. Had what's the experience? What do you want to highlight? What do you think is going to be the most memorable and meaningful? Um, so to notes and remember to collect those, like I said. Um, and I wrote again to bring the big to collect them in. I like across the chest because with my son, uh, he definitely requires two hands when we're out and about. Um, and child is not present to make the book it can be made ahead of time when they're not there. If you want to make part of it and they help make part of it, all the different options there. The book we made was a bowling book, just another example of an against book. And if you want to see more, I had a videos of this up on that past the literacy website I was telling you about. I don't have uh, time to share all that now, but they go into depth in these if you're wanting more information. But here are the objectives I had for the bowling book we made. Him. Uh, Liam will be able to use the bowling book as a tool to share his experience. Liam will be able to read the story to himself using contractions like can, go, and um, I've been learning at school. So I wanted to make a book that supported his learning at school. And for modifying object, uh, for modified object, <laughs> objectives, excuse me, is um, you can focus on vocabulary, communication goals, or a story and sequence. Quincy, these books can be taken apart, and you can work on beginning, middle, and end if that's one of your goals. Uh, also, can be used for reading or retelling an event. Um, this is what was in our bowling um, book. These five highlights I picked is he ate pizza, drank pop, he got to bowling shoes. He was able to carry his bowling ball to the ramp and push the ball. He got to feel a big pin, and then he had little toy pins and the ball to play with when he was there. And he got to visit with friends. So I make sure to include all those in his book. And so pages, um, pages of the book. So we had the bowling pins on the front cover, which compare to the bigger pins. And so he knew the, the difference between the, the toy pins and real one. Um, we had a shoe that kind of felt like the bowling shoe. Uh, we had a, I saved part of the, the cup from his pop and the plate for the pizza. 
So where I could, I used real life objects. Um, when I couldn't, I improvised like with the puppy paint ball in the corner. But really, you want to try to use real life objects um, when you can. And the, the, the slide about experience books is it's an opportunity to share. So we always want to share with a friend or especially grandma. So he was able to share the next day he wanted to bring it to school. He's able to bring it to school and read it to his friends. So what a motivating way for help a child who just can love reading. Experience books about trains, just another example there. Got to go to an 1880s train. He loved it. If you can see the smile on his face sitting next to his grandpa with his um, the wind up in there, he got to feel the breeze going through this train. And so I actually brought the book. This was made ahead of time because I knew what we were we were going to be doing. It he got to read the book on the train. Okay. That's one conversation box. What is conversation box? Um, if we any speech teachers here, you'll really love this one especially. Um, it's a box of items. In this case, items about a shared experience that a learner can use to have a conversation with someone about the items. So on the picture on the right is my son Liam when he was just, just a little guy. He might have been three or four there. And he is making toast, and that's actually his interpreter there over at house some summer. And they're making toast together. And so when the experience was over, I had get items so they could put, have a conversation about it later. At this point, Liam was just relearning another language. Before he got sick, he spoke English. After, when he began deafblind, his new language is American Sign Language. So he is starting over. We're trying to teach him all these vocabularies and teach it through experiences. And their way to encourage that, again, was a motivating activity. And to use this box with the objects too. So we have a jar here and a little plastic spoon to represent the jelly that he used. We had a little toaster, a play toaster. We had a plate that he used, a one off because it got really sticky. So think of things that him and uh, his interpreter will be able to talk about at school the next day about that experience. It's something he already is the expert in and knows about. I included I don't know if you can quite see on the picture, but a little strip of labels of Braille. So you could add that just to give more exposure to Braille. Braille, why not? So it said things like jelly, uh, plate, toast, toaster, knife. So just, um, just more exposure to Braille is always good, even if your child is, is um Braille reader yet. So the conversation box is the farm. I collect some items like hay. There, um, Mother and I are laying in this big corn pit. So I collected some corn so we could talk about that. Liam with his big pumpkin there. In the box there is the pumpkin stem because he ripped the stem off right away. So all these momentums where we can just, it encourages him to have this chat about the farm trip that we took. Another one of my very favorite. Uh, a story box is simply a collection of objects or symbols that are used in telling a story. Stories are a great way to make pictures come alive for our children with vision impairments. That of Liam uh, getting to explore a story box that I made for him. And, and little face I get every time he gets a new book. He just loves reading. Recently, a story box called Clifford's Bedtime. So, I have a book that is Braille. You don't, don't sometimes even necessarily you can have the book or not have the book. You can tell a story with them. I have the book here and it's Braille. And it's about Clifford and his mom and mom's putting him to bed at bedtime. So, Clifford's in his bed and he's his toy bear. He needs his toy, do his doll. He needs a drink of water. He needs his blanket. So when I told this story with Liam, I follow along on the book if he wanted to. And I was just was telling him the story, having fun with it. And, and we sat in a bed since the story took place in Clifford's bed. And we would give 
Christmas with Toy Bear. We'd give him the doll when, when the story came to it. We had um, him drinking water. We got to put blankets on everything. So it's just a fun way to engage him in the story, and he loved it. And it was another great thing about story boxes is that it allows children, even if they aren't able to read quite yet, it allows them to retell the story to somebody else as well using the objects themselves. Here that I've done, the picture on the right is called Owl Baby. It's about a mom and her three little uh, baby owls. Mom goes away hunting, and the three babies are um, worried and wondering where mom is. And I, this one, I could just quickly throw together for Liam. I don't have any Braille on it because the book meant where I know this story was going to be read. I found out kind of last minute that this was the book that was going to be read to the whole group of kids, and quickly found all three babies and a stick in my yard so that when we went to the event, Liam could in story, but also the pictures as well. The thing left is uh, a way to store some story boxes that are kind of, that are fun. Uh, I had stackable uh, plastic boxes and stack of that's four stories there. I also put on the outside of the box you know, that the top one is about a boat, so it's a boat story. And then I actually have a picture glued to it, too. The picture, there's the story and the braille and print as well, so that Liam, when he wanted to go into the closet and find a book to read, he can easily find which one he wants by feeling the outside labeled box. It's accessible to him. Talk about the actual sharing part of story boxes briefly. We can talk about that. Um, this is how I've done it and found success in it, but of course it can be modified to whatever works for your, the child you're working with. Is how you, before you do it, it's really important to think about how you're going to organize your story, your story box. Are you to lay out the items next to you so you can give them to the child as you're reading when it's time? So it's nice to organize. Are you going to keep them in the box, and then when it's time for it, the child picks them for you, does it, or you find them together? So you kind of want to think about that ahead of time. So that's organizing. What do you do when the objects are done? You, how are you going to lay it so that it, the transitions of the story move smoothly? Thing with sharing uh, your story box with a child is first allow the child to explore the items and in the box. Let them then talk about them, give some information about them, talk about the characters, what is this, what does this represent, and take time to introduce the story. Give a brief about what you're going to be reading about. Then take away the items if that you wanted it organized and tie together. The very last part of this is don't forget to provide the opportunity to share. They can read tell it with you. They can go take the object and share it with a classmate, with a friend, with a family member. So, so many different options for using a, a box that are, it's just a powerful way uh, to pour love for literacy and make it engaging and fun. And, and of course, meet different learning goals you have um, as far as literacy goals would go. So tactile books and concept books. You'll, uh, the book on the right, oh, well, let's just start with tactile books. Tactile books are graphics are basically just a graphic that you can touch. And so it makes uh, touchable pictures, except pictures for our students. So you choose what you think would be the most important thing. Uh, to take. You don't want your books to be too easy, but what would be the most important picture to highlight that they can feel and that can represent it. I have a sled book on the right, lower right there. We got done sledding at the time. I have this cool Pinterest to make um, cream and glue or something. So it made this really cool textured thing for snow. And I used the, uh, the butter container as the sled. The closest thing I could find that felt like the sled we had at home, because we had just got done 
um, I pull around on the sled in our yard. And so it was a great, great time to make a book about a sled. And this book actually was a big story box because it came with uh, got a little boy and his bear, too, that pulled the sled. So it's a little bit of both. The picture on the left is a concept book. You can make books that create and teach certain concepts that you're trying to, um, that, that are part of your goals. For example, teach small and big. So we on every page, we had something that was small, something that was big, something that was small, something that was big. And of course, we labeled it in Braille, even though he was still working on pre-Braille skills, like in Braille yet. Yeah. But a great way to introduce it by having Braille in all of your books. Another goal is I recently for Christmas made him a super book. He was Superman for Halloween. I wanted him, I just got to thinking that he doesn't necessarily know about all of the fun kids that his classmates and brother would know about, like Spider-Man and Superman, all of those, Batman. And so I started with a Superman book, and that told the whole story about Superman. Uh, that's an example of just one of the graphics I did so he could see the S shape that's on Superman's chest. Um, readers. This would be another way to uh, show tactile graphics as well. Those uh, classrooms I showed you kind of at the beginning, here they are uh, adapted, modified. Um, the one the upper left hand uh, was a bedtime book, and so it shows it on the lower there, my tea, or my toothbrush, and I glued a picture of a real, or a, excuse me, not a picture, and that, to represent the picture of a toothbrush there. The next page was I wash my face, so I glued a piece of washcloth on there. The next page was something I think about uh, pajamas. I put my, my jammies, and so I, I cut up a little piece of his knees um, and glued them in there. So that's just a way, easy way to make, make to him. The right was about the rainforest. Well, sometimes you're going to get books that maybe aren't necessarily, I didn't think it was the most appropriate book for him, uh, but he was part of a guided reading group. So he gets a lot of balance and instruction. So a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with reading with books that are more tailor-made for him. But because I wanted inclusion and I want him to participate in the things that are happening with his clients, they were reading about the rainforest. So he got a rainforest book, which is great for learning about that. And we had... About so with the birds, I made sure to include a feather. I found a butterfly. I found toy frogs, and I made like a little rainforest box. So every time they talked about an animal, he would be able to put the animal um, inside of the, the rainforest as well, just to make it more active, fun, motivating for him. His classmates get these beautiful illustrations, and he gets the equip that, that in a way that's um, accessible to him. Other examples of ones I made of the hungry caterpillar, um, a book of Australian animals. Those animals are removable and could be put in a um, another paper. Uh, I want to picture that, but it was like a, a graph kind of a thing. He'd be able to put those. So it made it interactive and fun again for him. Other examples I made of Easter, an Easter book, uh, a mom, a mommy book. I was going away on vacation, so I made him a mommy a book. So um, just think that something interesting and motivating again. My is supporting this love for reading for our early uh, readers. Um, here examples of adapting science books and nonfiction readers. Uh, I made a bird book, and so I wanted to. This is when he started second grade. I, I started looking at some of the things I knew his classmates would be learning about in science, and I wanted to make sure he had books ahead of time. We, we put these in his library at school, actually. I wanted him to have library books he could check out that would be matching what they're learning in school. So I did some life cycles, life cycles of birds, eggs, what do they eat, seeds and worms. So I glued some, found some sick feeling worms in the tackle section at the store, uh, the area, and glued bird seals kind of thing. So real life, you can, or feel as close to it as you can. Uh, life cycle book of a tadpole. I have some great uh, little 
both of those. Um, the life cycles of tadpoles, there's one for bees, I think, that I made, and one for a sea turtle. Example of this one is just for fun. Um, a word dictionary I made. Our classrooms that my son has had have these word walls on the wall, and they're up high where if you're sitting at a desk, you can see print, but if you're a Braille reader, that's not accessible to you at all. And so I made this word, which is like a dictionary, but also the purpose of it was to bring word wall accessible back down for him. So as he was learning words, he could put them in his dictionary, uh, stick them on there. Oh, look, um, <laughs> add words that are important to him, words really motivating. And it was a great way to review words that have been learned. All of these books we talked about can support IEP goals um, or special education goals you have for your child. Um, so you have books that are specifically tailored for the learning you have for your children. What I did here, um, we just got done with a meeting at school. And some of his goals, again, were some um, um, good language, so working on some adjectives and describing words. And I had just got a new car at the time. So we made a book about, we took about the new car and, and describing the tires on the inside, what it feels like, the windows, all of these things, something that's motivating to him. But it supports the goals as well. The picture of him in the fridge. We, uh, he's working on categorizing things like what belongs in a fridge, what belongs in a living room, what belongs in a classroom, those kind of things. So we made books about that as well to support those um, goals at school. Way books. Um, create accessible literature for our children takes a lot of time. <laughs> it can take a lot of time. Some can be quicker, but some of them, they, they take a lot of time in planning. So what I've done to help, help with this is I, yearly, before school starts, usually I'll have a book name party. And a lot of times the schools have helped um, cost of, of the parts as well. But I usually have them at my, my home. And I hand out kind of books we I want because I kind of look the standards for the school year ahead of time. What kind of books do you, what kind of goals do I anticipate him having? Uh, the standards, and then I create these lists of books ahead of time, and then I pass, and then I assign, or they get to pick my friends that come over. I have great friends, and I come over, they pick which book they want to make, they make the pick the book. If they know how to Braille, um, some of them have taken Braille classes. They know how to Braille, the Braille for me. If they don't, they just write in print. And then uh, my for Liam's uh, I will Braille them uh, after the, the party's over sometime when we have time. So we're able to make at least 20 books in one night usually. And so we've done that for a few weeks for school. I've done it for I wanted Christmas books one time, so we cranked out a bunch of Cool Christmas books. Um, it's a great way to, to to get friends and family involved. And I'll shout out to his team as well. Usually, most of the members of his, his uh, school team come to my home as well and help make books. And these used usually because books he gets school books, but we will use these to put in his school library at school. So he has books that he can check out from the library like his peers do, books books that he's interested in. So what I've used is I try to get sturdy pages to support tactile pictures, so chipboard page books, uh, Michael's Hobby Lobby, I don't know if you all have those there, um, but also Amazon, if you look up chipboard books or binders or um, what are they called? Um, the, the, you'll have a whole bunch of unique ones that are reasonably priced on Amazon.com as well. Stock pages work. Um, it's not 
really destructive with books, those will work. Liam, when he was younger, we had to get the really heavy duty stuff, but now he's a lot uh, careful with books as he's gotten older, so we can use a little bit thinner pages with him. Others, and you can place them in a binder. That's another way you can make, make a book. You can read children's board books. So that would be a more inexpensive way. Quick ideas for kids who are deafblind, just a couple that I've done. Um, storytelling. It's really with building, it's, it's, I really am focusing on the storytelling process with him, enjoying stories, learning about how stories go together, about fiction, that it's not, that's a really hard one for him to get at first was that um, this is a story about a long time ago, it's not happening now. So that's something you can um, practice. I'm tactile signing with him there. Uh, the picture on the right is, um, I'm seeing with my son Liam, I made got these homework tools. They're senior, so I can work on homework across from with him in good form for tactile signing and not have to pull him across to talk to me, but I can easily reach his work, uh, sign with him at the same time. So if he's providing access to the Braille, but I'm providing access to the to ASL as well. Um, so good, proper form. So just a, a review and then hopefully have just a couple minutes if you guys have. I wanted to save a few minutes if you have any questions for or, or comments. I'd hear from you. But we have talked about the importance of creating an accessible environment for our children. It's important for them to uh, feel I so that, that they feel like they belong, that it's worth it, <laughs> that you know we create this for them. But it's also setting the stage for them to be readers and to see that Braille has power and it's meaningful in their world, that it's important. And then so talked a lot about experience books, how those can be a great way, a motivator, and to encourage and support a love for literacy because the books are about something they know about, they care about, they enjoy, they've experienced, they're the experts in it, so that it's setting them up to be successful. Twitter boxes and conversation boxes, items that can go with a story, uh, making the pictures come alive. And the benefits, especially with story boxes, is it aids in the contention of the story, retaining the story. It's motivating. It's fun. Their peers get to see beautiful pictures. And story boxes, we can have experience in a way that's tangible. And tactile graphics we talked about. Make sure I've always thought that Liam, if if mates are seeing enjoying these pictures and if they're using them to help them as early readers, if they're using the pictures to help them understand what they're reading, Liam should have that same opportunity in a way that makes sense for him and that's accessible to him. So I, um, I think certain and then choose tactile graphics that, that make sense, that that tell the story and that I try to pick ones that I, I know would be um, really motivating for him. I wanted to share the Path to Literacy um, website. That's my link to all of mine. Um, I have a couple pages just of books, strategies, and stories, and things that I have tried adapting. Um, kind of fun to see. I started four years ago, so when Liam was three, and so it's very early pre-Braille skills, and then all the way up till now when he's seven, and he's actually reading uh, quite writing quite well, so you get to see um, a range of different ideas and strategies as well that you can hopefully. And I think, do we have a, a few minutes just to, if anyone has any questions or anything they'd like to share? Time. Uh, we had one question that came in uh, on the chat is asking, do you use the Oakmont books? The books. I can't say that I have. <laughs> um, I don't know what they are. I'm sorry. Okay. So the Oakmont books were made um, by a group of um, in, in the United States, and but. I believe they've made them for a number of years, but they okay. were very similar 
conduct development book. And they would oh. send them out to us for free. So, oh, that's wonderful. But I don't think they've been around for 15, 20 years. Okay. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. No, I have not heard of them. Any questions from the group? Um, Did you even just open your microphone or throw up your hand? The idea of, uh, of uh, creating the Cacao book and then having them available in the school library uh, for, for Liam to be able to access there like uh, the rest of the kids uh, are. Appreciate that. Yeah, I was always a little frustrated with the library because we could get books, but I mean, he probably would be happy by the time they didn't have any pictures in them. They weren't that motivating for him, and it wasn't fun. So it was nice to have. Our school is so awesome. They literally cleared a whole shelf off for him. Actually, I think he has two now, and he just has boxes and boxes and boxes of books he can go look at when it's library time. So that he can be included that way. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? So there are a couple of hands up. Um, okay. Why don't you go ahead? I'm not sure who put their hand up first. Now I'm just going off the bat of things. <laughs> your mic. So, Corinne, I'm going to unmute your mic. So you're unmuted if you want to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about adapting some of the um, some of the times that you added onto the playground. Using uh, some sturdy braille labels. Do you know where you got those from? Um, I don't understand the first part, but are you, you're wondering where I get the braille labels from? Not, yeah, the sturdy ones, not just the, the braille oh, ones. What? Oh, labeling. Oh, 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 that's right. Um, I went online and I, I can't tell you his name right off. I just went online and looked up. Um, Let's hear. I looked up <laughs> pretty braille outdoor labels, and there's a whole bunch of different companies that came. I went and emailed the first that I or the first website that I could find, and they were probably about $5.99 each. But the gentleman, when I told them what I was wanting them for, uh, sent me all of them for free of charge, which was really nice. Oh, kidding. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but if you just look it up, dirty about there was quite a few popped up. You go ahead. Hi, so I just wanted to say um, I wish all of our parents were were like you, and we're so uh, eager to help. And I know you did it for your son, but that certainly helps the rest of us as educators if we had parents like you um, helping the team. And I also wanted to say that uh, with regards to the Oakmont books, it they still do make them. I haven't purchased any for or haven't received any for a couple of years, but certainly within the last 15, I would say within the last five, I'm still able to access those. Really have to check that out. Yeah, yeah. I think they're actually made by uh, people, convicts that are in, in uh, the prison, actually. <laughs> oh. That's really neat. Yeah, I know we have our we have a prisoner that brails uh, Liam's textbooks at school as well. Oh, that's cool. Yes, thank you for that. No. Comments that people have um, on the chat box, and most of them, Sandra, are are brilliant. Lots of amazing ideas. I love how. You incorporated members of the community. Thank you for the presentation. A lot of positive feedback from participants in the um, in the community of practice. And I think we're just about out of time. Is that correct? Now? Okay. So um, I, I would really, really like to thank you for giving us so many suggestions and wonderful ideas of how we can build up literacy skills in our young children to just that love of, of, of reading that we so want them to have by the time they are school. So thank you very much. And, yeah. uh,
um, if we were to move from you on past the literacy, there is, which is where I first encounter your information. So thanks so much, Sandy. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Perfect. Guys, thank you so much. So just a reminder that, that it takes us a little while to convert uh, the video, but this video will be available. I'm going to guess that people are going to want to go back to it because there was so much good information, and we'll have that posted um, hopefully uh, within a week or so. Um, and then it, it's on the RLC site, so if you're not sure where to get that, uh, just let us know. Um, and again, Really appreciate it. No, the, the, the PowerPoint has already gone out, right? Uh, I sent the PowerPoint out. Some of some were returned because there was to the end. So um, I it, think it, it'll get posted with the ER. So, okay. then, so guys, just so you know, if you haven't got the PowerPoint, it will end up getting posted um, as supplemental material with the video when we post it. So it will have a path to it. So thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to give you a few seconds here in case anybody has any last comments, and then I'm going to get it uh, all shut down. Uh, Sandy, thank you so much. Yeah.